The fallacy of presentism is described by David Fisher in Historian's Fallacies Towards the Logic of Historical Thought. And Fisher provides examples of historical writing where the interpretation was presentist because it did not depict the past in an objective historical context, but instead viewed history only through the lens of contemporary beliefs. So this kind of approach emphasizes the relevance of history to the present, and things that don't seem relevant receive little attention, and it results to a very misleading portrayal of the past. So regarding James's theory, just a couple of ways of looking at it. One would be the belief that ancient man is psychologically identical to modern man, or a belief that ancient religion is similar to modern religion. These are just a couple of examples. It's important to note that this is not conscious, generally it's an unconscious assumption that's made, and it's not something that historians are even aware that they're doing. So the presentist fallacy then with regard to ancient civilizations, it, it stems likely from both this specialization in academic fields where you have these classicists, but they're not really that interested in, in the psychology. They're interested in other things. And, and this innate tendency to interpret things that look the same as being the same. So ancient people look like us, therefore they must have thought it like us. They don't look like cavemen. They seem to be just like us. So because of this, then, a lot of the evidence when you see people writing about ancient civilizations, what would be evidence for bicameralism is just ignored. It's sort of viewed in isolation as just kind of a weird thing that they don't know what to really make sense of. Or most often, it's giving these modern interpretations. So this is why people didn't see James's theory earlier, is they're, they're skewing everything that James would see as evidence in a modern context. A big one that Rabbi Cohn just talked about was that ancient texts are frequently translated to sound as modern and as readable as possible instead of making a literal translation. And this is especially relevant when it comes to psychological language. So you'll see texts that in, in a literal translation would not have this type of mental introspection language, whereas in the translations that are popularized, it does. So just some examples then of this and, and then how you might respond to objections based on this fallacy. So a final example I'm going to give, also McCarthy Jones. So he says, he's quoting someone here, but he says, there's absolutely no evidence that people routinely heard voices of the gods in Mesopotamia. So of course, this is very different from what James is saying. So how do you square this? So this statement also can be viewed in terms of the presentist fallacy. What McCarthy Jones is, he's expecting to see these overt, modern sounding descriptions of voice hearing that we would expect today. And while this type of evidence exists elsewhere, in Mesopotamia, it's, it's a lot more subtle and it's harder to find. So if we think back to the model then, we see here that we have an existing false premise, this presentist fallacy creates a skeptical reaction to the theory followed by a narrow focus on one or two pieces of evidence. So next we'll review the pattern of evidence and then revisit this question of whether or not the descriptions of the gods should be interpreted literally or metaphorically. And we have to look at the pattern of evidence to see if, if James's claims hold up rather than just these one or two examples. So I just talked about these are the four. These first two are just misconceptions. The second two are actual critiques of James's theory. Now we'll look at examples from Greece, and then a much more broad analysis of Mesopotamian texts, and then also some modern cases. So if we go to Assyria, I'm just going to go through a lot of this fairly quickly. All the wars were started at the God's command. The preamble to the account of a campaign always contains the statement that it was undertaken at the command of the God. So this, again, doesn't seem like a metaphorical interpretation. So this is interesting. The Mesopotamians believed that the ear, not the brain, was the seat of intelligence. And if we're looking at this again through the lens of James's theory, this would make a lot of sense if most of their insights were coming from hallucinations. And this is kind of a parallel to what you'd see in modern command hallucinations. And someone had asked a question, I think, on Wednesday about this social structure, just get to that, viewing authority as a power inherent in commands. So this very strict hierarchical society. Only the gods were truly citizens in the political sense. It's very difficult concepts for us. The basic estate, the main temple with all its lands was owned and run by the city god who himself gave all important orders. The manager of the god's estate was expected to consult the god and carry out specific orders which the god might wish to give. So again, it's a very different type of thing 
and very hard for us to relate to. We're a few blocks here from the state capitol, and you have to imagine a situation where the capital is, all the leadership are all gods, and these gods made all the governing decisions. There's royal statues set up in the temple that were given offerings, and the statue, not the king, is treated as a divinity. So this is a very, very different kind of world. So the NC would go into the temple at night, sacrifice, pray, lie down to sleep, and in dreams the god might then appear to him and give him his orders. So this is an interesting question why we see a much better record in Mesopotamia for bicameral dreams than we do for waking hallucinations. And this is something that would be a great topic for further research. The evidence for the waking hallucinations is more indirect than in other cultures. But they're really the bicameral or visitation dreams and the waking commands are sort of two sides of the same coin. So the gods communicated with the king most directly in dreams. So each person had a personal god or goddess. The gods constantly intervened everywhere and participated in everything. The gods expressed their will through their words and their commandments. These are translations of the texts. The Mesopotamian is constantly admonished, pay heed to the word of thy mother as to the word of thy God. So all this is evidence that they're really experiencing these direct commands. A man must truly proclaim the greatness of his God. A young man must wholeheartedly obey the command of his God. Again, a translation of a Sumerian text. And Mesopotamians frequently wrote letters to their gods. So this is really hard to imagine if there's not some type of reciprocal communication going on. What came out of the mouths of the gods, and these are all translations, was sublime, powerful, imposing, and above all, impossible to modify and even less suppress. So here again, we see kind of a parallel with modern voice hearers. So a man's, everyone had a personal god, as I mentioned. A man's personal god was always ready to bring his dependent before the great god, and he would watch over him and keep him from evil influences. But now we see this description of this breakdown of the bicameral mind. So if reason of, by reason of sin, the believer ceased to be the son of his God, which was a phrase they used, then the latter would turn his face from him and one of the demons would enter into the place left empty by the God. And then we have a really great description of what James would view as this breakdown of bicameralism, a time when they stopped hearing the voices of the gods. All omens and signs became confused. The gods gave no clear answers to man's questions. No orders were transmitted. Sinister portents appeared, and with fear and foreboding, man awaited catastrophe. So most of you are familiar with, in James's book, the picture of Tukulti Ninurta that Rabbi Cohen just showed kneeling before the empty throne. Here is a different king, also here before an empty altar or throne. And James would look at this as this departure of the gods. So at this point, some people might think, well, it's, it's all very interesting, but how can we ever really know what was going on in these ancient civilizations? It's, it's all open to conjecture. This is why I always like to extend the pattern of evidence to modern cases. So in a chapter titled The Schizophrenic Woman Who Heard the Voices of the Gods, UNLV psychologist Herbert describes auditory and visual hallucinations in a modern Dutch woman whose experiences are nearly identical to what Jane's describes in the bicameral era. So what Herbert, this is of course very exciting in terms of new evidence for Jane's theory. Because you see lots of cases of command hallucinations, but this is interesting in that she's also interpreting it as the gods. What Herbert has done is developed a method of sampling inner experience involving a beeper that goes off at random times. And at that time when the beeper goes off, the participant writes down what's going on in their inner experience. He's been doing this for like 30 years. So in this case, he was sampling the inner experience of a 30-year-old Dutch voice hearer named Sally. Nearly all of her samples involved hearing voices that were understood to be the voices of beings whom she called gods. The gods' voices occurred singly in groups and issued her direct commands. She repeatedly heard voices she took to be gods talking to her and giving her commands. And the voices were very similar to what would be perceived as hearing someone's voice in normal reality. So this, this is an especially interesting case because she's not only experiencing these command hallucinations, but interpreting them in this very Janesian way. And she also had visual hallucinations of gods. Final piece of evidence we'll look at then is the phenomenon of, of imaginary companions in children. And a recent study of 1,800 children suggested as many as 46% of 
of normal children experience imaginary companions. And this is something that, along with the command hallucinations, that I think mainstream psychology doesn't really know what to do with. If you look at it in terms of James's theory, it makes perfect sense. And so this is another piece of new evidence that I recently found that's very interesting. So Josephine Hilgard, a clinical professor of psychiatry at Stanford, reported that some children experience a conscience-related imaginary companion, one who criticizes, is concerned with right or wrong, of matters of propriety and impropriety. So this is, again, exactly what we would expect from James's predictions. So if this child were growing up in Mesopotamia, this would have evolved into their personal god. So this whole idea of conscience-related imaginary companions has never been discussed before. This is something new, and I think it's another important area of new evidence. And as far as I know, no one has followed up with these studies looking at this conscience-related type of imaginary companion. So if we conclude and we look back at our initial poem about the god abandoning uh, this person, we have to say the pattern of evidence suggests that we should take a literal and not a metaphorical interpretation of their descriptions of these gods, and that the, God, the commands of the gods were frequent and pervasive.